Hello, and welcome to my lecture on caffeine. Uh, unlike previous lectures, which occurred in series, uh, this one is a standalone um, about the drug caffeine. I'm using uh, the numbering system lecture five just to keep consistent with the numbering system of previous uh, lecture series. What I'd like to do in today's lecture is give an overview of the history of caffeine, both its uh, biological history in terms of the plants that it comes from and also some of the social history surrounding this drug. I want to talk a little bit about what we know about the current use of this drug and then talk about some of the acute and uh, chronic effects in the body. Okay, so the history of caffeine. Um, I gotta say, I'm looking forward to this lecture. I'm sitting here enjoying some caffeine in the form of a cup of tea right here. Perhaps if you're watching this lecture, you're drinking a cup of tea or a cup of coffee or something like that. So this is one of the few, perhaps the only lecture that I get to do in this class where I can honestly say, learn about the drug, do the drug, do it together, that's fine. In almost all other cases, whether it's LSD, cocaine, uh, caf you know, uh, PCP, uh, whatever else, uh, I can't tell you to use the drug here. You're probably, unless you have an adverse health condition or you're taking medication to uh, raise your blood pressure, barring those uh, possibilities, you're probably good to go to enjoy some caffeine uh, either on your own time or while you're enjoying this lecture. So the history of caffeine. Before really getting into the history of caffeine, I just want to introduce a basic idea, and that is, or a basic term, and that's the term alkaloid, or alkaloids, plural. Um, alkaloids are chemical compounds containing nitrogen that are found in plants, and actually also uh, non-plant sources like fungi. Uh, they're interesting to us because many of them have physiological effects in animals. And so, for the purpose of today's lecture, I want to highlight three, um, well, really one, but one of three uh, alkaloids in a group, the group being the methylxanthines. And these three uh, alkaloids are caffeine, theophylline, and theobromine. Now you know caffeine already um, just by glancing at the chemical structures of these different uh, alkaloids, you can see that they're quite similar. And uh, suffice it to say that caffeine and theophylline and theobromine have similar effects in the body. Caffeine just tends to have, for the most part, stronger effects, at least stronger effects for the stuff that we're interested in. So that's what we're focusing on. Now these methylxanthines, uh, these alkaloids, the methylxanthines occur in a variety of different plants. They're found in the cacao plants, it's where we get chocolate from. They're found in coffee, they're found in cola, they're found in tea, they're found in herba mate, um, which I am actually have had a few times. I'm seeing more and more frequently at stores and coffee shops. If you're unfamiliar with it, it's a, uh, it's a plant which is grown in South America and is brewed much like a tea for similar stimulant effects. It's actually quite nice. So if you see some in a health food store, try it. Herba mate. It has caffeine, it has some of the other methylxanthines as well. Now if we were to uh, extract caffeine from any of these sources and crystallize it, we'd end up with a kind of white colored crystalline powder that tastes quite bitter. And what's interesting about uh, this substance, caffeine, here we're just isolating caffeine, is that caffeine actually um, has some interesting effects on humans, of course, and other animals. It's a stimulant, but it also has some effects within the plant. And specifically, plants produce these compounds because they are fairly effective um, anti-parasite uh, defenses. So uh, plants like uh, the cola plant, like the tea plant, coffee plant, all produce these compounds to discourage parasites from eating them. So if you're, you know, um, an ant or a worm or a caterpillar on the leaf and you start chewing the leaf and you come into contact with these chemicals, it'll tend to paralyze or even kill you. That's the natural defense that the plant has, or one of the natural defenses that the plant has against parasitization. And it just so happens to be the case that that poisonous effect for little tiny insects for larger animals, like, well, non many non-human animals and certainly humans, is a kind of a mild stimulant effect. So uh, what works for plants in one way works for us in a somewhat different way. So that's a little bit of, uh, of a preview. And like I said, caffeine um, has mild stimulant effects in humans. Um, if we focus, uh, for the purpose of my history, I want to focus on really two sources of caffeine, tea and coffee. And we could talk about chocolate, we could talk about herba mate. I would if I had more time, but this is already a fairly long lecture. So let's first focus on tea. Um, 
T is a uh, it is derived from the plant the Camellia sinensis. There are a number, well, a couple of different varieties of this plant, and a number of different kind of cultivations of it. Um, but in one way or the other, it's all the tea plant. And as you may know, the tea plant is originally native to Asia. In fact, most tea is still grown in uh, China or in India, although tea is now grown also in Africa as well. The history of tea dates back to truly ancient times in China and is actually shrouded in a certain amount of mystery and mythology. Um, if we go back to maybe around 3000 BC, we encounter a figure, Shen Yung, who was uh, thought to be um, either a real person or, or kind of a mythical person who was a, a great leader uh, in ancient China and is uh, now sort of thought of as the father of the traditional Chinese medicine system. So uh, Shen Nung apparently wrote down one of the first pharmacopias of different plants uh, in his region. You know, he is famous, as you can see in this uh, woodcut print here, for uh, tasting different plants and observing the effects that they had on him. And it's, uh, it is alleged or it is supposed that he was the person who perhaps first discovered tea, first discovered that if you found this particular plant and chewed on its leaves, or better yet, created a brew by boiling it in water, you could experience some pleasant stimulant effects from it. You would feel a little bit more alert, your concentration would seem a little bit more sharp, and um, you probably would enjoy that experience. Now, for many hundreds of years in China, um, the use of tea was fairly restricted to ceremonial purposes and, re and religious purposes, in part because it was fairly uh, difficult to cultivate successfully, at least large, large amounts of it, and to process into a form that would be pleasant to drink. Of course, over time, uh, agricultural techniques became more sophisticated and more tea could be produced and the price of tea within China became uh, came down and tea was used by more and more people and began to have medicinal uses and, of course, social uses. And just as a, 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 a side point, I would say that that pattern of a, the discovery uh, by the indigenous peoples of a particular area of a, an herb or a plant or a fungus that has a particular uh, psychological effect on them, um, and then its gradual use in first religious and ceremonial practices and later in medicinal and social practices, that pattern or, uh, is a pattern that we'll see for some of the other drugs that we look at. It's sort of the common way that mankind has discovered different drugs over the millennia. So anyway, a lot of history um, has been written about tea in China and tea elsewhere in Asia, uh, but the risk of being somewhat uh, Eurocentric, we're going to skip ahead in history all the way from ancient China to about the 15th or 16th century. And this is when approximately, uh, traders from Europe, especially Portuguese traders and explorers, began interacting uh, with the Chinese and began trading tea and other commodities from that region. Now, tea grew in popularity in Europe during the following centuries, um, but it was an expensive thing to import all the way from China, and thus was mostly a luxury for the very wealthy. Um, it was difficult to import uh, tea, partly because of the long geographical distances involved, obviously, but also because trade was very tightly controlled for tea. So most of the tea that was known in the world was being produced in China, and almost all of that, at least for a period of time, was under the control of various uh, Chinese uh, trading companies, which traded in tea and kind of had monopolies or near monopolies on the supplies of tea that were available in China. There's also a near monopoly by uh, several European trading companies, particularly the British East India Company, in terms of getting the tea and shipping it uh, to to Europe. So. The supply was tightly controlled and the price was fairly high, making tea something that you could have perhaps if you were very rich, but probably not if, if you were, were not very rich. And this actually leads to an important idea, or at least why I think is an important idea. It's something that I think we'll see again and again as we look at different drugs. Uh, one is that controlling the trade of drugs, and here we're talking about tea, something that you might not even consider really to be a drug or a particularly ex even exciting thing to think about, but even controlling tea uh, meant controlling large amounts of money. Uh, here you have some pictures of British uh, silver coins, which were some of the uh, you know currency that was used to trade for tea 
tea way back in the day. It was an interesting thing. The, uh, the Chinese uh, at the time really had very little interest in trading with England or trading with other European countries. They were a large and relatively prosperous self-contained society on the other side of the world, relatively speaking from Europe. And they really didn't have, Europe didn't have anything that China wanted except for initially money, uh, silver. So enormous amounts of money flowed out of Europe to purchase this drug, caffeine really, in the form of tea from China for a very long period of time. And the control of those vast amounts of money made some people incredibly rich and kept other people poor, or at least out of the market. Another important idea that goes along with this is that attempts to control trade in drugs, and again, even drugs like tea, which doesn't, again, seem like cocaine or marijuana or some of the drugs that you probably think of when you think of drug trade, but controlling the trade of drugs uh, can, in terms of taxing it or trying to regulate the trade of drugs can sometimes lead to unintended consequences. So some of the very same problems that we see today with the trade in illegal drugs were occurring back in the 17th century around the trade of tea, problems like smuggling. There was an enormous amount of smuggling of tea into Europe and even into America. And there was, you know, there were, you know, crimes and crime syndicates uh, organized around importing this precious and highly taxed and highly expensive commodity. There's also a problem of adulteration. You know, if you were able to buy tea in Europe or in America during this time period, you might wonder if the stuff you were buying, you know, the dried up brown leaves were in fact tea or might not be something else mixed in with the tea to increase the supply and increase the profits of the dealer. So those same problems, which again, we might see if we looked at the trade in cocaine or even the trade in marijuana, uh, were happening around the trade in tea you know, several centuries ago, which is kind of amazing to think about, or at least for me to think about as I sit here, and as I said before, just enjoy a cup of tea, which seems a bit sort of simple and maybe even a bit boring, but it was big stuff. People died, people went to jail smuggling tea back in the day. Now I said before that Europe and especially Britain were trading mostly silver for tea, for this valuable commodity. Um, over time, though, the Europeans, especially Brit the British, hit on a better idea or a more effective idea in terms of their trade. They traded opium for tea. Um, England at the time controlled uh, most of the world's opium supply because of the land that they had seized in India and were able to export opium <coughs> from India to China. And the addiction that that created in China created a huge demand or provided a huge demand for the opium that the British controlled. And in trade for that, or to satisfy that demand, Britain traded for tea, which satisfied the demand of tea for tea way back home. Um, so it's a, it's a really you know fascinating thing to think about, a fascinating period in history that I've, I personally have enjoyed reading about a little bit is the way in which the trade in one drug was linked to the trade in another drug. And again, nowadays, if you talk to people about drinking cups of tea, I think it conjures images of, you know, little old ladies in church basements or sipping a cup of tea or maybe someone having a glass of iced tea on a cold or on a hot day after mowing the lawn. Um, these kind of pleasant images, I suppose. But back in the day, it was big business and big business that involved violence, involved crime, and involved the trade in other drugs, which is kind of amazing. Um, I'm gonna provide a link on the Blackboard site to a very interesting video game that you can play online. You can see it down in the corner here in the picture. It's called High T, high being, of course, kind of a pun. Um, and it is uh, it allows you to play as a trader who's trading opium for tea during this time period and, and it's an interesting game to play if you like those sort of resource management type games and it also provides an interesting bit of history uh, as well and you can play it online for free just using your computer so i'll link to that another important or i guess i'd say at least interesting idea is the way that Attempts to regulate drugs uh, um, and encourage people to use or not use one drug can have interesting and uh, sometimes unfortunate unintended consequences. So part of the uh, demand for tea in Europe, especially in England during this time period, is that people just like to drink tea. You know, caffeine's pleasant for most people. Tea is nice to drink, or at least I think it's nice to drink. Uh, but part of it was because people at the time, or at least some people at the time, were looking for an alternative to drinking alcohol. We'll talk about this 
this in a future lecture, but alcohol use and alcohol abuse is a long-term uh, phenomenon that has occurred in Europe and in America and elsewhere around the world for literally centuries of time. And during different periods of time, temperance movements have arisen. Temperance movements are movements which encourage moderate or even uh, moderate use or even abstinence from use of alcohol. And so, um, you know, religious leaders like John Wesley, pictured here in England during this time period, encouraged people to give up using alcohol and to use tea instead, which is a noble idea, or at least I think for many people that would seem like a good and healthy idea. Um, an unfortunate piece of iron, or bit of irony in history, I suppose, is that demand for tea, which was in part encouraged by people trying to find a healthier, a healthier alternative to alcohol, subsidized an incredibly unhealthy drug uh, habit in another part of the world. It increased the demand for tea in England, which led to increased trade and increased demand for opium in China. Okay, so moving forward into history, uh, like I said, for a long period of time, uh, England was trying to trade in silver and then later in opium uh, with uh, with China for tea. Um, but because uh, you know people like to control their own business and not have to buy from other suppliers, um, the English and other European countries tried to smuggle tea out of China. And one of the people who was successful in doing this is a fellow named Robert Fortune. He was a Scottish botanist and kind of adventurer, almost like a kind of Indiana Jones of tea, if you can imagine that. He uh, worked and lived in China for a period of years and then smuggled tea out of China into India, effectively breaking the Chinese monopoly on tea. Um, as a result, because tea could be grown in India, tea became much less expensive and um, uh, became much more accessible to people of different economic means back home in Europe and even in America. And as a result, the English gave up trading opium for tea in China. Just kidding, they continued trading opium in China for many years after that. And uh, so did other European countries and so did America as well. And I'll talk about that in a future lecture when we talk about the opiates and we talk about the opium wars. Anyway, so to move it forward into the 19th and up into the 20th century, and really even up to today, if we look in Europe, uh, we see that tea grew in popularity, and that popularity sustained for a long period for a long period of time, and indeed up to today, especially in Britain and in Ireland. Um, so yeah, I think about going to visit my English relatives, and I think about having cups of tea with them. I still like to drink tea, and probably some of that is from having that early experience of having tea with my aunts or with my grandmother uh, way back in the day. So fond memories. Of course, if you remember your high school history class, you will remember um, the colonial period in America, and you may know already that tea was traded quite a bit back then. It was popular uh, among people who could afford it, but it was expensive in part because of the geographical distances uh, involved and the difficulty in shipping something like tea long period, long distances and keeping it dry and not wet and spoiled, etc. But it was also expensive because it was fairly heavily taxed, in part because the British East India Company and other trading companies needed to make money, uh, given the or needed to and, and wanted to make as much money as possible. So they uh, imposed taxes on the tea that they were were trading in, and this led, along with other complaints, to um, in a way to the American Revolution. So you think about the Boston Tea Party as being this act of civil disobedience where tea shipments were thrown into the Boston Harbor, actually elsewhere along the Atlantic coast at the time, tea was seized by colonists and either destroyed or held uh, without paying taxes on it. It was a way of re uh, rebelling against um, the authority of England to impose taxes on things, even things like tea. In a way, tea has never been as popular in America as it has been uh, elsewhere in the world, especially in Europe. But people still do drink a lot of tea here in America. Certainly most of it we have as iced tea. I, mean, I think about living down south in Florida for many years when I was in graduate school. Drank a lot of iced tea down there. Uh, very nice beverage to have on a, on, a, uh, on a hot day. And probably something that we can even enjoy way up here in North Dakota. So anyway, that's a little bit of the history of caffeine focusing on tea, I want to transition now into talking about the history of caffeine focusing a little bit on coffee.
And coffee, as you probably already know, comes from the coffee plant or the coffee uh, sort of it's a shrub. There are a couple of different varieties of it, like Arabica and Robusta. Um, it's native to Africa and Asia, but as we'll see in a few more slides, it's now been planted around the world, including uh, places in South America and even Hawaii. Now the history of, of coffee is uh, it's kind of uh, like the history of tea is sort of um, you know shrouded in in ancient history. Uh, we don't know exactly who first discovered uh, the use of coffee. There's some evidence that the Oromo people, who are an ethnic group that lives in what's now Ethiopia and Kenya and Somalia, first discovered uh, coffee. There's also some evidence, or it's not really evidence, there are really some interesting and probably apocryphal stories about uh, a particular goat herder named Kaldi, uh, who lived in what's now Ethiopia, who discovered the effect of coffee when he noticed that his goats, when they ate the berries off a certain particular plant, would tend to get very excited and would jump up and down as if they were dancing. So the, this sort of uh, legend or this myth about the dancing goats and this goat herd is kind of attached to our, our notion of the origin of coffee, you know, where coffee was first discovered and how it was first used. It's actually interesting to notice that if you type in Caldi coffee or dancing goat coffee into a Google or you know other search engine image search, you get lots and lots of hits. And there are a number of companies uh, and uh, you know coffee shops now that call themselves things like Caldi's coffee or dancing goat's coffee or whatever else. If you've ever seen any of these when you were traveling or, or buying coffee in the supermarket and wondered what's the deal with the dancing goats, now you know. It has to do with this legend about a person who may have discovered coffee way back in the day in Ethiopia. Now, later on in history in Africa and in the Middle East, uh, coffee was used uh, ceremonially and for religious purposes, kind of like we saw a little bit with tea much earlier in history in China. Uh, coffee was especially associated with Sufism, which is a, a form of Islamic worship that emphasizes uh, kind of a, a sort of a mystical connection to God. And so people who would, uh, you know, participate in cere with Sufi ceremonies and would be up for long periods of time praying or meditating or dancing would drink coffee as a way to kind of keep themselves stimulated and awake. Um, I didn't include a slide on this, but that's certainly true of tea. You know, if we look at the rise of tea in China and elsewhere in Asia, it was tied to uh, religious practices, including Buddhist meditation. So there's that idea again that we have a, a drug which is discovered and it has, at least for a time in its history, a kind of a religious or ceremonial connection. But later on in history, kind of like we saw with tea, coffee too kind of transitioned from just being just kind of a, a ceremonial uh, beverage to being something that was used medicinally uh, to stimulate hunger, um, to make people feel more alert if they were feeling drowsy or weakened from illness, and also just being a social beverage that people enjoyed uh, centuries ago, much as they enjoy it still today. Now, throughout Africa and the Middle East and even in Europe, uh, during this time period, there came to be coffee shops or coffee houses. These were often kind of interesting alternative establish establishments to taverns. So in places, uh, uh, in countries that were majority Muslim, those were of course attractive because many Muslim people, most Muslim people, especially historically, have shunned the use of alcohol. But even in Europe where uh, alcohol was and is you know, commonly used, some people would alternate to going to coffee houses so that they could enjoy this relatively new beverage, coffee, and they could sit down and discuss politics or the economy or philosophy and religion with one another. In Europe, coffee houses were sometimes called penny universities because for the price of a few pennies, you could buy cups of coffee and you could sit down and talk with your friends and with your colleagues, you could learn about everything. So you could get an education and a cup of coffee. I like that phrase because it reminds me of when I was an undergraduate going to coffee shops um, in New York, where I used to live, and uh, sitting down and you know drinking coffee for long periods of time and thinking important thoughts and talking with my friends. Um, it's interesting to note that different points in history in the Middle East and also in Europe too, uh, religious leaders tried and political leaders tried to make uh, coffee illegal, tried to prohibit coffee 
uh, sale or coffee consumption, in part because they feared subversion. You know, they, the idea of people getting together to debate politics or discuss philosophy can be threatening if you're a politician or a religious leader. So that led to uh, several attempts over the centuries to prohibit coffee. Uh, but none of these attempts were very successful because coffee was a popular uh, beverage to consume. People just liked it too much. And also it was a very valuable commodity. So if you uh, wanted to prohibit uh, coffee, you had to contend with all the people who were making money off of trading in coffee. And usually money wins out over politics. I suppose that sounds a bit cynical, but I think it's often true. Um, speaking of money, over time, uh, smugglers got coffee out of the Middle East, away from the countries that controlled it, and began to sneak it into other parts of the world, which is why coffee is now planted around, um, around the world. So anywhere between the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn, roughly, is the coffee zone, where it's sufficiently close to the equator that we have a hot, moist climate that can grow coffee. Um, in America, the only place that, that, that satisfies that requirement is uh, Hawaii, where you can get some really nice coffees, uh, as you may already know. An important idea that comes out of this, I think, is that prohibiting drugs is difficult. And I'm not here to argue that drugs should all be legal or drugs should all be widely available or widely used. I just think it's historically evident from what we know about drugs, even drugs which seem relatively benign, like caffeine in coffee or tea, that prohibit prohibition just doesn't often work, or at least it doesn't often work as well as we would like. Um, it's difficult to entirely get rid of a drug in a society that tends to like that drug. And often, uh, trying to get rid of drugs leads to unintended consequences, like I said before. So things like uh, adulteration of drugs or smuggling. And there's actually, a link to it, a book which I've just found online, I haven't yet read, called The Coffee Smuggler, uh, which is about a guy who smuggled coffee out of the Middle East to South America. So, interesting. Another important idea, and this is me, I suppose, getting up on my soapbox a little bit, is that the production of drugs, even things like tea and coffee, is often associated with exploitation of poor people. And that's absolutely the case historically for tea and coffee. Um, there are, is a long and terrible history of slavery and near slavery, abusive of poor servants and planters and pickers in plantations in China and in India and in coffee plantations in Cuba and elsewhere. Uh, that's all in the past and even continues today. The, the working conditions of people who work on coffee plantations and tea plantations even today are not on the whole very good. Um, and because coffee and tea are probably things that you buy at least time to time, I really would encourage you to try to learn a little bit about the ethical trade in these products. There are now companies which try to do fair or uh, ethical trade in coffee and tea and other commodities like that. And when possible, I would really encourage you to try and buy these products, even if they're a little bit more expensive. I drink a lot of tea, uh, but I do try to buy tea from sellers who have relationships with the people who grow the tea and provide a fair price, rather than exploiting growers for as much tea for as little money as they can possibly get, which historically speaking has been the way it's always gone. Um, so again, it's a little bit of me moralizing, so forgive me if, that, if that's sort of off topic or irritating. Um, I will say though that for many other drugs we'll look at the same phenomenon is true. If we look at the production of cocaine or if we look at the production of marijuana, we often find that the people at the very bottom of the, uh, or at the beginning of the line, the people are actually growing the plant, are often treated very poorly. And um, in a way, I think that's something we have to be honest about if we're using drugs, that we're part of an economic system which at least can exploit people if we, if we let it. So in the case of your coffee and your tea, try not to let it exploit people. Okay, so back to the history then. Um, if we look at America during the 18th and 19th and even up into the 20th century, um, coffee w was and still is an alternative to tea. Um, it was for a period of time uh, relatively cheap as compared to tea, which has always been kind of expensive. I think there's probably a certain amount of patriotic pride associated with coffee in America, especially following the Boston Tea Party. So maybe early on coffee had that kind of um, that kind of popularity that tea didn't, it didn't suffer from that stigma. 
Certainly when we look at the 20th century, the Industrial Revolution made coffee production much, much cheaper uh, and coffee became much more widely available. And then during World War I and World War II, you know, the war years of the 20th century, coffee was included as some of the basic rations uh, for soldiers fighting um, in Europe and elsewhere. Interestingly, that phrase, cup of joe, which you sometimes hear, like, give me a cup of joe, meaning a cup of coffee, traces its origin back to this time period when American soldiers, G.I. Joes, were known to drink coffee in preference to drinking tea. And so we're called, you know, that Joe soldier, Joe coffee kind of created a link there. So um, for those reasons and for other reasons, coffee became and, and still is, of course, trem tremendously popular uh, in America. Um, later on in the 20th century, of course, we had the invention of the coffee break, which was designed by advertising agencies to encourage more coffee consumption at work. And if we think about modern coffee consumption, coffee is very popular. You don't need me to tell you that, I suppose. Um, its quality is very good. I mean, I'm old enough to remember when coffee was pretty terrible, when the coffee you would buy at the store was pretty bad, or the coffee you could get at a gas station or even a coffee shop was kind of bitter and unpleasant. You had to put a lot of sugar or milk into it. Nowadays, coffee is really good. It's also really expensive, something I notice every time my wife and I go to Starbucks to get our, our respective coffee drinks. Okay, so I've given you a lot of history here, some biological history, some social history, um, a couple important ideas that I haven't mentioned, or, or rather that I have mentioned, but I think I should repeat. Um, caffeine is an alkaloid. It's uh, present in many plants. It has these interesting physiological and psychological effects, which I'm actually going to get to in just a few more slides. Um, caffeine is popular. Uh, it's always been popular, and trade in caffeine products has always been profitable, and restrictions or attempts to restrict that trade have always been difficult, um, or you know, at worst, entirely unsuccessful, but at best, difficult. And that's a pattern, as I've said, that we see a lot when we look at different types of drugs. Okay, now let's briefly talk, after having gone through all that history, about the current use of caffeine. You know, what do we know about how much caffeine people are using nowadays? Well, first thing to note is it's actually fairly difficult to measure how much caffeine people use. And that's partly because uh, there's not as much concern about caffeine use as there is about the use of many other drugs. So people just don't take the time to conduct large scale surveys and ask people how much caffeine they're using, or at least there's not as much interest in doing that as there is say in surveying high school students or college students or young people or just people in general about their use of illegal drugs. The other thing that makes it difficult to measure uh, caffeine use is that caffeine's in a lot of products. Caffeine is obviously in some beverages that we're familiar with. It's in a fair bit of food that we're familiar with. It's in a lot of medications. If you look at the ingredients on many of your over-the-counter medications, especially painkillers and cold remedies, you'll often see that they include caffeine. And it's weirdly even in some beauty products. Now you can't quite see it, I don't suppose, in this image. Maybe you can, you probably have to squint a little bit at this picture, but this is a picture of a shampoo which uh, is supposed to give you thicker, fuller hair, and there's a little seal on the front saying, new caffeine energizer. I actually bought some of this shampoo at our local uh, grocery store, Hornbacher's, here in Fargo, North Dakota, uh, just because I was intrigued. I thought, well, I'm getting older, my hair is thinning on the top a little bit, maybe I can use this stuff and it will make my hair thicker and fuller because of caffeine. Um, I'm not really sure. I don't think it did much for my hair. Uh, but the idea that I was somehow rubbing caffeine into my scalp every day when I shampooed my hair was kind of fun. <laughs> Here's a table from a textbook that I sometimes use in my class, and it just attempts to um, provide um, some detail for the amount of caffeine in different uh, beverages that you might commonly have. Um, so different types of coffee, different types of energy drinks. Um, it's not important here that you memorize specific numbers. I think it is interesting to note, though, the variability in caffeine content across different types of beverages, and even within a particular type of beverage as a function of how it's made. So if you look at coffee, different ways you can make coffee, brewing it using a drip, uh, a brewing process, using uh, instant coffee, using or making espresso, you get somewhat different levels of caffeine. Um, uh, in a typical, you know, sort of cup of that beverage. And different types of tea, likewise, have different levels of caffeine. 
Um, here are some energy drinks. Um, this data is probably a little bit old. I'm not sure if you can still find all these around, but suffice it to say that there are a number of different energy drinks out there. They vary in how much caffeine they have, but if you click back to the last slide and compare to coffee and tea, you can see that the total caffeine content in many of the um, <clears throat> many of these sports drinks or energy energy beverages you can buy is quite large relatively speaking you know upwards of many you know several hundred 400 500 milligrams of caffeine in a typical dose and just lastly here are some different foods and medications that have caffeine in them obviously things like chocolate have caffeine uh, and then you can see here some different prescription and non-prescription medications that have caffeine in them so how do we know how much caffeine people are consuming? Again, it's really tricky because if you wanted to ask people, you'd have to ask a lot of questions about how much chocolate they eat and how much tea they drink and what type of tea is it and how much coffee and what type of coffee and do they use the shampoo? Actually, that probably has no effect on the amount of caffeine in their system, but you'd have to ask a lot of questions. We don't know. We guess probably that people average between 200 and 500 milligrams of coffee per day. Um, the textbook that I'm using uh, this summer, uh, the book Buzzed by uh, Kuhn and colleagues, I think estimates that around 80% of all Americans consume coffee, I think coffee, or at least caffeine every day. Um, we say they're getting about you know, between two and five cups worth of caffeine, or two and five cups of coffee worth of caffeine every day, whether that's in coffee or in other sources. So again, you can see there's some variability around that, that level. So we've talked a little bit about history. We've talked a little bit about the current use of caffeine. Let's talk now about the acute effects of caffeine. What does caffeine do in your body when you consume it? Well, um, here I'm going to jump over to some images that I took from one of my favorite web comics. It's called The Oatmeal. You may have heard of it. It's pretty popular. Um, the Oatmeal has a, uh, a whole uh, section about co uh, 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 coffee and caffeine. I'm going to pull out a few of the images uh, here, including what the author calls the five phases, phases of caffeine intake. And these are funny, but they're actually fairly accurate as well. So let's take a look. Phase one, pre-caffeinated. This is where you're angry, you're irritable, you're tired, you can't concentrate, you're in a bad place. Phase two, the first few sips and the magic of caffeine begins. Then there's the caffeine high, which might not be quite that exciting, but I think for many people, caffeine feels good. Then you have, well, some of the effects of caffeine. And then you have the post-caffeine crash, stage five. Like I said, this is a little bit funny, and a lot of the web comics on this site are funny, so I encourage you to check it out. But it's actually fairly accurate, describing the kind of the arc or trajectory that you go on when you consume caffeine in coffee or in, in other sources. So let's take a look at a few points for to see how that works. All right, first off, of course, we know that most uh, caffeine pretty much all of it, uh, is going to be administered orally, meaning it's going to be absorbed in your stomach and small intestines. A fair amount of, uh, well, a fair amount, a, a relatively small amount of the caffeine is absorbed directly in your stomach. Almost all of it is absorbed in your small intestines. Um, caffeine is water soluble, meaning that it's fairly easy for it to get into your body because in general drugs that are water soluble do get into your body fairly well. Um, there's rapid absorption. Um, if there's variability in this, but the peak uh, caffeine level in the blood will occur between 15 and 45 minutes after you've uh, taken the dose, and the full effect of the drug more or less overlaps with that time period. So if you drink a cup of coffee or a cup of tea right now, you can expect within, I don't know, maybe as early as 20 minutes, maybe as late as an hour on, you'll start to feel a little bit more alert, maybe a little bit more mentally sharp. Uh, and that period of time will, will kind of tail off afterward. Um, how fast uh, you get the caffeine into your body uh, depends somewhat on the source that you're getting the caffeine from. There's some evidence to suggest that you get faster absorption from coffee or tea as compared to soda. I'm not exactly sure why that is. It may be partly just the concentration. You know, if you drink uh, a cup of coffee that's a relatively small volume of water with all the caffeine dissolved in it as compared to drinking you know, a, a 20 ounce bottle of soda, 
There's also some evidence that sugar in beverages will tend to slow absorption of some drugs. So we see this a little bit for alcohol. I think you'd see a similar effect for caffeine. So perhaps if you were to drink a decaf, or I'm sorry, a diet soda, you might have relatively faster absorption of caffeine than uh, if you're drinking a regular sugared soda. Um, so anyway, some variability in how fast uh, caffeine is absorbed, but not a whole lot. It basically works in approximately that timeline for most people for most of their caffeine consumption. Once you've absorbed caffeine, it fairly evenly distributes throughout the body. That's actually important because the effects that we see from caffeine occur all around the body, both in the periphery and in the central nervous system. And that's in part because caffeine can kind of get almost anywhere it needs to go in your body because it's so water soluble. Now, um, a term that I haven't introduced before, but we can introduce or I, I will introduce right now is uh, the term half-life. A half-life, if you've taken a good physics class, will of course remind you of uh, you know radioactive decay, or if you haven't taken a good physics class, I suppose we'll remind you of playing video games. Uh, but in this context, half-life is the amount of time that it takes to remove half of the available drug from your system. So if we want to get really technical, we can measure the half-life in different uh, systems of your body. Typically what we're talking about in half-life is the serum or you know the blood serum level of a drug. How long does it take for your body to get rid of about half of the total amount of dose that you were that you gave yourself? Well most of uh, your caffeine gets metabolized by the liver and there's some variability in the half-life of this drug um, from as little as a couple hours to maybe as, as many as 10 hours. Um, it's somewhat longer in children and in pregnant women and in the elderly. Interestingly, it's somewhat shorter in smokers. So if you drink coffee and smoke cigarettes like I did during my undergraduate years, I would not recommend the smoking part, but the coffee is just fine. Then you tend to get faster metabolism of, of, uh, of caffeine. So there's some variability and this in part explains why we see people, uh, you know, some people can have a cup of coffee early in the day and be just you know, perfectly fine to go to sleep later at night. Some people can have a cup of coffee early in the day and still feel kind of wired and, and sort of buzzed and a little bit, uh, you know, too alert to fall asleep even much later in the day, like at bedtime. So this is a fairly long half-life, uh, or can be for some people. It can cause some sleep problems. Um, there is some interesting genetic variation in metabolism for caffeine. Some people, uh, by virtue of their genes, are relatively faster caffeine metabolizers. Some people are relatively slow caffeine metabolizers. Um, I'm not sure about myself. I suspect I'm a fast caffeine metabolizer because I've always drunk a fair bit of caffeinated beverages and I tend to get over the caffeine effects pretty fast. I almost never have the problem of drinking coffee or drinking tea and then having a hard time falling asleep at night. Okay. So a little bit about how uh, caffeine passes through the body, uh, how it gets into the body, how it passes through the body. Let's look at some of the acute effects of caffeine. Well, first, in the peripheral nervous system, we can focus on some of the major um, systems in, well, in the periphery or connected to the peripheral nervous system, including the vascular system. Um, at relatively low doses of caffeine, you know, maybe the amount of caffeine that would be in a cup of coffee or a cup of tea, there's not a huge effect on the heart rate. Uh, but at higher doses, if you have a couple cups or a strong uh, sports drink, you can see increased heart rate, which can actually be quite quite marked. If you have like a high dose of caffeine, you can get maybe a 15 beats per minute jump in heart rate or more. There's also an interesting effect in the peripheral uh, vascular system where uh, blood vessels will dilate under the effects of caffeine. They'll become wider and this can actually cause your blood pressure to drop a little bit. Although if your heart rate spikes up, that can offset the drop in blood pressure as well. If we look in the vascular system elsewhere, up in sort of inside the skull, um, the vascular system within the skull uh, under caffeine has constriction of blood vessels. So the blood vessels that flow up to your brain and kind of contact with the blood brain barrier to exchange nutrients and chemicals, those blood vessels will uh, constrict and show reduced blood flow. So um, that, that effect can actually be fairly strong. You can actually get a fairly marked decrease in blood flow to the brain under uh, caffeine. Not so much so that you do damage to your brain 
uh, but it's interesting to note that you can get a fairly, you know, uh, a drop in pressure in the skull. And this is actually interesting. It may help to explain why caffeine can be useful for treating headaches. You know, depending on the type of headache you have, some people get a fair bit of benefit or relief from drinking caffeinated beverages. And if you look at the ingredients on the side of many pain relievers, you'll notice that they include caffeine, especially uh, pain relievers. I think Excedrin has it, maybe Advil as well. Uh, pain relievers that market themselves as for treatment of headaches especially or migraine headaches will often include some sort of analgesic like acetaminophen or ibuprofen and a fairly hefty dose of caffeine because decreasing the pressure inside the skull by temporarily shrinking those blood vessels decreases some of the pressure pressure on the tissue which otherwise can feel inflamed and can contribute to the pain that you experience as a headache. We're still kind of in the periphery of the body. Let's take a look at the digestive system. Caffeine causes an increase in the release of gastric acid. Um, in the excretory system, uh, caffeine slows the release of the antidiuretic hormone from the brain. This is a hormone that your brain uh, is secreting from the pituitary gland um, just all day long, pretty much. Uh, and it kind of acts as a braking system on the natural tendency of your body to get rid of excess water. So when we slow down the release of that hormone, it has the effect of allowing a faster uh, elimination of water, what we call a diuretic effect. So you have to go, you have to pee or you have to uh, go to the bathroom for other reasons more frequently than you otherwise would if you're drinking coffee or tea or caffeinated beverages. This is one of the reasons why when people are really dehydrated, like after exercising for a long period of time or after you know, driving on a car trip for a long period of time, um, it's not always a great idea to have caffeinated beverages because that can exacerbate the, di the, uh, the dehydration. It's another reason why if you are, get very dehydrated from drinking alcohol and you wake up with a hangover in the morning, even though you feel tired and groggy, it can be good to avoid, well, in some ways, it's good to have caffeine in the morning if you're hungover because it can decrease the pain of your headache. But it can also uh, further exacerbate your dehydration because, again, caffeine will tend to cause this dehydrating effect. So why does caffeine have all these effects around the body? Uh, why does it have some of the other effects that I've mentioned uh, before in the central nervous system? Well, a lot of the story has to do with adenosine. And if you can see here in this picture, we've got a diagram of a model of adenosine and a diagram of a model of uh, a diagrammed model of caffeine. And even without knowing a lot about uh, about chemistry, you can just see that the kind of ring structure of those two uh, molecules is fairly similar. And that's important because what that allows caffeine to do is interact with systems in the body which normally use adenosine as a neurotransmitter. It in, caffeine interacts in such a way that we call it an adenosine antagonist. And what we mean by that is it fits into receptors which normally um, accommodate adenosine, but it doesn't activate those receptors. So normally uh, at the synaptic level, adenosine would drift across the synapse. It would fit into receptors and cause those receptors to activate. Caffeine gets in there and blocks adenosine, but doesn't have that same activating effect. So essentially it prevents adenosine from doing its job in all the different places in the body where adenosine is normally used, including some of those places in the periphery that I've already mentioned, and some of the places in the central nervous system that I'll talk about in just a bit. So again, it's an adenosine antagonist, meaning it blocks or antagonizes the adenosine system. And as I just said, adenosine is used in different systems throughout the body. In general, it's what we call a neuromodulator in that it acts to influence other neurotransmitter systems. And often what it does is it acts as the break, like the slowing down or, or sort of down-regulating effect on other neurotransmitter systems, including, uh, for instance, uh, dopamine. So <clears throat> when you take away the break, when you take away the break, uh, the car speeds up. Uh, we see a similar sort of effect here. Adenosine normally down-regulates different parts of the nervous system. It makes you feel uh, more tired, makes your brain essentially less active. If you block adenosine, your brain's going to become more active. Uh, by de so caffeine decreases adenosine activity and other neurotransmitter systems increase in their activity. And we can see evidence of this at a very global level if we record electroencephalogram, you know, brainwave measurements, and we can see it at more kind of focal levels.
too. So if we zoom in on the frontal cortex, um, there's uh, adenosine, or by influencing adenosine systems, caffeine will lead to increased uh, activity of dopamine systems in the frontal cortex, which probably accounts for some of the mild stimulant effects of the drug. Interestingly, uh, it will decrease activity of gamma aminobutyric acid, or GABA, in the motor areas. GABA, like adenosine, is normally a breaking uh, neurotransmitter, or kind of a modulating neurotransmitter that slows things down. By interacting and interfering with GABA systems, as well as adenosine systems, caffeine can lead to kind of more motor energy, making you feel a bit more jittery or energetic if you've had enough caffeine. So I mentioned dopamine just a, a second ago, which should get you thinking about the reward pathway, that mesolimbic dopaminergic pathway that I've talked about in previous lectures. Well, caffeine causes some increase in uh, dopamine activity in that system, but not very much, at least not as compared to some of the other drugs, which we'll consider later in the semester. That means we don't get a very strong sense of, of pleasure or reward when we drink caffeine or when we consume caffeine as compared to say when we consume cocaine. So there's not a strong positive reinforcement for using this drug. And by extension, we could say there's not a lot of potential for psychological addiction or psychological dependence for this drug, at least not compared to other drugs. Put more simply, caffeine you know, feels good, but it doesn't feel great. And you probably know this. I mean, gosh, sometimes it's really nice to have a cup of coffee. Sometimes it's really nice to have a cup of tea, but very seldom is it the case that drinking that cup of coffee makes you feel absolutely amazing. It's just a pleasant thing to do. So we look at these acute effects, what are some important ideas to take away? Um, caffeine has some stimulant effects on the peripheral nervous system, just as an example, increases heart rate. There's some other examples that I could put there as well. It also has some stimulating effects on the central nervous system, generally increasing activity, which subjectively feels like increased alertness and increased uh, energy. And it does so largely by impairing neuromodulating uh, system, so especially the adenosine system, but also the gamma aminobutyric acid system. So it kind of takes the brakes off temporarily and allows your brain to speed up a bit, which is why you have some of the experiences of increased alertness, increased energy that you have when you consume caffeine. Okay, so what about the chronic effects of caffeine? What are the long-term effects of, of this drug? Well, the short answer is there are not a lot of negative long-term effects uh, for using this drug. I haven't included a lot of slides about that. Um, your book covers some of the research on the long-term effects of caffeine and essentially finds that there are few or no uh, negative effects unless you're already at risk uh, for illness or unless you're consuming very large amounts of caffeine. Uh, but people sometimes wonder, you know, is it possible to come, become addicted or dependent on caffeine? Um, that could be a long-term effect that people might not like. You, know, you might not want to be addicted to a drug, even if the drug was for relatively benign. Um, so the question, is caffeine addictive? Well, as we saw earlier, there's some positive reinforcement for using caffeine, but not a great deal. Um, there is some significant negative reinforcement for using caffeine, but this is relatively short lasting. So again, if you use the drug, you don't feel absolutely amazing when you use it. So there's not a ton of reward, not a ton of positive reinforcement. Um, when you stop using caffeine, if you're a regular user, there can be some withdrawal effects. And I'll talk about those in just a slide or two, but they're relatively short lasting. So we'll talk about kind of tolerance and withdrawal in the next couple of slides. First off, tolerance. Um, tolerance develops fairly quickly for some of the central nervous system effects that I mentioned, not so quickly for uh, some of the peripheral nervous system effects. Um, what does this mean? It means that people who use coffee typically, or, or I should say use caffeine in the form of coffee or in, in other forms, tend to want to use more and more of the drug in order to get the same uh, desired effect. And I've used this ex in examples previously in lectures. You probably are familiar with this example from your own life. You know, you begin drinking coffee at the beginning of the semester and you have a cup of coffee every day, but by the end of the semester, you're drinking two or three cups a day just to experience that same level of of mental boosting that you were getting from one cup earlier on. 
there is withdrawal from coffee, or I'm, again, I keep on saying coffee, I should be saying caffeine. There is withdrawal from caffeine. If you're a regular user and you stop using, you'll start to have headaches. That makes sense because there'll be an increase in blood pressure in your skull. Uh, you'll feel drowsy. That makes sense because your body is fighting against the speeding up effects of caffeine by trying to slow you down. And so when you stop using caffeine, you feel that slow down as drowsiness, fatigue. And there's also some irritability. I'm not exactly sure where that comes from, but probably if you have a headache and you feel drowsy and fatigued all the time, it's hard to be pleasant with other people in your life. So those are things that happen to you um, when uh, you stop using caffeine if you're a regular user. So tolerance and withdrawal are not the only components of addiction or dependence, but they're two things that we often think about. Um, tolerance, well, tolerance occurs, um, I would argue it's not much of a problem, because caffeine is legal, so becoming tolerant on this drug doesn't put you in any danger. I mean, it costs a little bit more to buy two cups of coffee than it does to buy one, but it doesn't lead you into a life of crime. And also, caffeine is safe for most people. You know, unless you have uh, very high blood pressure, unless you are pregnant, uh, unless you're taking drugs that can increase your blood pressure, unless you have uh, you know ulcers in your stomach, there. Probably are, you know, in those cases, you might not want to drink caffeinated beverages. Uh, in almost all other cases, caffeine is going to be pretty safe for you. So although people can become tolerant, and that is kind of a sign of dependence, it's not a sign that probably provokes a lot of concern for us because the drug is legal, the drug is safe. Withdrawal occurs for this drug, um, but as much as it does occur and as much as it can be unpleasant, it tends to resolve fairly quickly. Um, the exact timeline on this probably varies a bit, but you know, sources I've read said, uh, suggest that within a week or so, people can get over caffeine withdrawal. So if you decided to quit drinking coffee and quit drinking tea and stop drinking Red Bull, whatever else, um, you might feel tired and irritable, you might have a mild headache, but after a few days or a week or so, those symptoms would be gone. And they're probably not going to be so unpleasant as to cause you a lot of suffering or to you know really drive you, uh, well, they might drive you to go back to use the drug, but it, again, it's not that hard a problem to use the drug. So do people become tolerant to caffeine? Yes. Do they have withdrawal? Yes. Is caffeine addictive? Um, I don't know. Probably in some ways it is, but it's certainly a kind of a mild addiction as compared to the addiction that can occur to many of the other drugs that we'll talk about. And so I would suggest, as the uh, maker of this image suggested, life is short. Enjoy your coffee. Okay. Important ideas to think about. Users develop tolerance and withdrawal to caffeine, especially those central nervous system effects like the increased alertness, increased energy level. Caffeine is addictive. Um, it's less so a psychological addiction or dependence and more so a physical one. And that distinction of psychological and physical is a little bit misleading. The key here to notice is that the addiction is probably more a function of negative reinforcement. You feel bad when you stop using coffee and that may push you back to using it more, more so than the desire to feel particularly high from the effects of the drug. But again, even if it is addictive, it's not that addictive, and it's certainly not that dangerous, at least not for most people. So I would say, enjoy your caffeine. With that in mind, um, I would direct your attention to a movie that you could find probably on Netflix or other sources called Coffee and Cigarettes, or Cigarettes and Coffee, um, or you could probably find on YouTube, there's a particular clip in this movie, it's a Gus Van Sant's movie, it's a series of vignettes in which people drink coffee and smoke cigarettes and talk to each other. There's one featuring the Jizza, the Rizza from the Wu-Tang Clan, and Bill Murray from Ghostbusters and many other movies having a conversation in a restaurant while drinking coffee and smoking cigarettes. And it's actually very funny, and there's only a little bit of adult language. So take some time and watch it if you want. But if you don't, or even if you do, take some time to relax, maybe have something caffeinated like a cup of espresso here, maybe some sort of uh, nice tasty treat to go along with it. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this lecture. As always, thanks for your attention. If you have comments, let me know on Blackboard or even put them on YouTube. I'm trying to watch those to respond to them if I can. Um, and uh, like I said, thanks for your attention and I'll be back in my next lecture very soon. Bye-bye.